And I'm looking forward to talking to this man because I've been talking about uh, you. You want to talk about insider trading or what they do in Congress? Well, this guy actually got arrested for doing this. So, but he's going to talk about it. 2009, arrested and charged with insider trading. And what happens next is all laid out in uneven justice, the plot to sink Galleon. Let me welcome to the show for the first time, Mr. Raj. Uh-oh. Raj. <laughs> oh, man. He told me as a Raja, <laughs> Raja Ratnam. Raj, hey. Raja, Raja Ratnam. Welcome to the Karen Hunter Show. Thank you. Great, Roger great Ratnam. attempt. Roger Roger Ratnam. Roger Ratnam. Take a deep breath and say it all at once. You'll make it. Roger Ratnam. All right. What is it? Got what is Raj? What? Because Raj is a, is a popular name in India. What does yeah, Raj it's a mean? Name. Uh, Raj actually means king. Okay. And Ratnam means jewels. So, you know, when you combine the two, I am I guess I'm a jewelry man. King yes, of jewels. Are. All right. So how did you get uh, all hemmed up? inside it how'd you get martha stewart in it talk about it so um um let's go back to 2008 there was a financial crisis in the united states precipitated by the big banks that gave mortgages to low-income people that they couldn't pay and they designed these balloon mortgages it Wait, pa pause for a second, Raj, because I, I need to pause you because that's not the complete narrative. The, the mortgages that were those subprime mortgages were not given to low income people. They were given primarily to black people. They were given primarily to black people. I got a subprime loan and I was not low income and I had a 700 credit score. I did not deserve to get a subprime loan with a piggyback and a balloon payment. I didn't deserve to get that. Right. You're and I looked, right. what okay. I meant was to people who couldn't service the loan in normal conditions, they kept the interest rates low and they had a balloon payment. When the recipient of the loan couldn't pay the balloon payment, they defaulted and sent the keys back to the bank. American people lost seven trillion, trillion with a T, dollars, and Wall Street was culpable. The big banks, the Freddies and the Fannies and the Goldman Sachs, Now, people, people you, were you, you, you're, you're again, you're again, you know, saying American people, but black households disproportionately, disproportionately we lost great. most of our wealth in that subprime debacle. So go ahead. Sorry. So you had a new uh, district attorney in uh, the Southern District, um, a gentleman of Indian origin, Preet Bharara, who came after the hedge fund industry, which had nothing to do with the mortgage crisis because people were looking for blood. He came, the FBI came with guns drawn, arrested me in the early morning. And this was a white collar issue. And I, of the hundred things I worried about, insider trading was not one. And what they essentially wanted me to do was to be a cooperator and point fingers at other hedge fund managers. Now, my hedge fund was a fairly large hedge fund, it was $7 billion in assets. And this is unique about the American justice system where a cooperating witness is given a free pass if you point fingers at others. And so how I was brought up is if you do something wrong, you admit to your error and take the punishment, but you don't point fingers like Judas at somebody else. Right? That's not how I was brought up. So I said, no. And he said, we'll give you 25 years. And I said, bring it on. And do you know, Karen, that 97% of the people who are indicted, either plea bargain or plead guilty because it's so expensive to fight the system. Now, the message of my book, Uneven Justice, is that the prosecutors have no downside, zero accountability. Now, criminal justice, there's bipartisan support, thankfully, for criminal justice reform. But criminal justice reform right now, the primary discussion is on police brutality in the street, and I applaud that. But there's so much brutality in the courtroom that is not visible. 
mm. and it affects black Americans and minorities disproportionately. And what? the point of the book is there's no accountability for these prosecutors. As you probably remember a few months ago, three people were exonerated of murder because the prosecutors withheld exculpatory information, DNA information, when a bunch of law professors in Queens, 21 of them, tried to publicize their case, the state, New York state, sued the, the law professors because they didn't want the truth to come out. So we have a system of uneven justice that if you get indicted, you don't stand a chance. I was one of the few people who went to trial because I was not going to plead guilty and play their game, even if it took me 25 years in prison. And you could afford to do it. We're talking with Raj, Roger Rotnam. Uh, he's the author of Uneven Justice. He's also the founder of the iconic hedge fund, Galleon Group, which managed $7 billion, employed 180 people in its heyday. And when they came to arrest him and, and uh, put him on trial, he was like, let's go. But tell us how you even got to that position. You're Sri Lankan, right? You're, you came here, your family came here when? How do you become the founder of a hedge fund that then goes on to uh, you know, manage $7 billion in assets? Yeah, so I came to this country after studying engineering in England. And I came to Philadelphia to do an MBA in finance um, in the University of Pennsylvania, the Wharton School. Uh, upon graduating, I came to New York, and uh, which was a culture shock for me. Why? And because everything was bigger and badder and faster. This is 1983. Okay, right? and dirtier. New York was dirtier, dirtier as hell in 1983. It was disgusting. Now, here's a secret, Karen, that nobody knows. I lived for two years in the projects in Fort Greene. I didn't even know what a project was. I wanted something cheap. I paid $350 for a one bedroom apartment on Willoughby Street right? in Fort In Green. the 80s. In, in the, the 80s. 80s. Okay. Now, when I used to go to pick up uh, groceries, I would see all these guys outside the liquor store with brown uh, paper bags, and I would say hi to them and so on and so forth. I had no idea what I was into. And I guess my dark skin helped me survive. Absolutely. They, you know, absolutely, brother. <laughs> absolutely. Thank Raj, you, sister. Roger, Raj. Yes. No, I mean, you know, this, this country, um, and I don't know how it is in England, uh, but, you know, being Sri Lankan is not, you know, it's, it's, it's to me because of the complexion, you know, it puts you in a situation where you you might have more more a kinship to the black plight in America, even though you can you know navigate differently. Um, but so well, so I think Karen recently in um, my daughter, who's a lawyer, works for SPLC, the Southern Poverty Law Center in Montgomery, Alabama. So Thanksgiving, I went to see her, and I went to the museum. Um, the uh, museum that uh, the lynching uh, one, the one that Brian Stevenson, Brian Stevenson, did the Equal Justice Founder, mm -hmm. and you know the the atrocities committed, which just made me you know just cry. What we've come a long way in terms of holding people accountable, but we have a long way to go. And no, and we say we are a democracy no civil society should give unlimited powers to prosecutors. And in the last several years, 800 cases have been overturned because of prosecutorial misconduct. 800. And 800, right? Look at the, the guys who were charged with killing Malcolm X, they were exonerated, right? The Central Park Five, did the they were falsely accused they were tried in the media even before the trial. Our ex-president took out an ad saying that death penalty should be given. And then they found DNA that exonerated these guys. So my mission is for the justice system to be a fair place. 
if you think I did something wrong, let's sit and talk fairly and don't bully me because that's not what America is all about. Or should well, be. Actually, about. I was going to say America is the original bully. What? America's founded on being a bully. This is like, this is your land. We taking it. Take this smallpox. Matter of fact, take these bullets. We're going to take all this. Oh, we're going to go grab some people from another continent, bring them here, build something. Here's a whip. We're going to beat you. Yeah, no, this, America's a bully. Uh, and I think we need to start telling the truth. But if we want to have a more perfect union, we need to uh, challenge and do the things that you're doing, which is to not accept accept this uh, behavior. Uh, but you didn't answer my question, Mr. Roger, Roger Rottenham. Um, you can call me Raj. It makes it easier for you. My no, name is no, always I, I, being a tongue twister. Yeah, no, Roger. No, it's not. Raj, Roger, Roger Rottenham. It's right there. You got it. Uh, all right. So you're in the projects in Brooklyn. How do you become a hedge fund founder? Walk us through it. Okay, so I uh, joined Chase Manhattan Bank, which was right in downtown. So my commute was five or 10 minutes by the D train or the F train. I uh, worked at Chase for two years and I joined an investment banking firm called Needham and Company as an analyst. And because of my engineering background, I focused on semiconductors. Semiconductors are chips that build all electronics. And I rapidly rose through the ranks and became president of Needham and Company um, at the age of 34. Then at 39, I said, you know, I'm approaching 40. I need to have a midlife crisis. Either I can go buy a car. I didn't want to change my wife because she's the best thing that happened to me. So I started my own fund and wanted to be an entrepreneurial entrepreneur, which was the American dream. So what does and, that look like? You know, today's Thrive Thursday on the Karen Hunter show. And I always want to break down the anatomy of a thing. You know, it's like, oh, he's a founder of a fund. Well, how does one just start a fund? Like ABC, take us through it. So initially you have to get money to manage a fund. So you go to friends and family. And because I was an analyst, I interacted with a lot of people in Silicon Valley. And I said, listen, I'm gonna start a fund, give me a chip. And I promise you, I will work harder than anybody else. And I started with about $10 million from about hundred people. And because so my- So a hundred people, uh, like, let me do the math on that. All right, so 10 million divided, so it was like a hundred people uh, gave you like a hundred thousand dollars. Correct. Okay. And, they and said, then, you know, you know, and I want to, I'm sorry to cut you off because, you know, we've been, you know, challenging people to save money and it's all about the collaboration. It's all about gatherings, all about the community. Right. And if you can get 10 people together to, to, to invest, you can do some things. You got a hundred people to invest a hundred thousand. I remember I getting a hundred. I had worked for 14 years prior to that. I'd gone and visited CEOs and CFOs senior management companies doing analysis on them. And I guess, you know, I'm a pretty good looking guy. So they said, hey, let me give you a chip and see how you play. Yeah. So you could start with 5 million. You could start with a million. The key is your results. If your returns are good, this money will find their way to you. Pretty soon, the... Uh, Dubai Investment Authority, the Sovereign Fund of Dubai, and major institutions um, invested in my fund. And, you know, so we built it over many years. And so you get to the 7 billion. The call comes. Did they, so they just came, showed up to your house with guns drawn. They and came knocked on my door. Knocked on your home door. Correct. In the, in the middle of the night, because they like to do that, right? It's the middle of the night or the middle of the day, like when the, early, early in the morning. morning. See, early morning. See, they have morning. a playbook. They have a playbook. They try to do it on a Friday because they can keep you overnight and break you, right? Before you, you can even get a lawyer and get your ducks in a row. So they came and knocked on my door, I mean, really hard. And they said, I said, who's this? And they said, the FBI. I said, what's this for? He said, open the door. I opened the door. They were like, 10 people, like in the movies. Now, Karen, you have to understand, I didn't know anybody went to prison. I didn't know anybody who knew anybody who went to prison. Right? I was just a working guy. So you had no clue 
Raj, that this was going to go down. No whispers that you were in trouble, that somebody was going to come. Nothing. They just show up. Which Which is unusual because for white collar crimes, what they do is they say, listen, we are suspicious of what you did. Come with your lawyer and let's talk. But remember, you had a rookie a U.S. attorney who wanted to make a name for himself. So he had cameras outside my apartment, CNN and all of that. Wow. And he had this big press conference. And, you know, unfortunately, the year before, I was on the Forbes 400 list as one of the most successful people. And that raised a lot of eyebrows. So I was on the, on the map. Mm. So I went in there and then they started trying to bully me. And I guess uh, in retrospect, uh, they couldn't. So. So they put you in handcuffs in front of your family? Right. Yeah. And you know what they told my 13 year old son? What? Take a good look at your father. You're not going to see him again. So and they. And they told my told me in front of my wife, your wife looks happy because now she can spend all your money without worry. So they're 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 trolling you while they're taking your freedom, putting your hands yeah, behind your back, throw you in the back of a car. Did you 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 went to jail? Fingerprinted, pictured a whole nine. You, yes, ma'am. Take us to the jail cell, and I I, I won't tell you not to ma'am me. Because that's going to be a constant theme, I think, for the rest of the year, Raj. But anyway, uh, take us take us into the jail jail cell cell when you when you arrived there because you've never been to jail before. What what was going on in your head? Well, when they talked about my son and my wife, I went into the zone. I said, "This is war. Now we need to focus." And so I went through all the motions, and then they wanted to inter- interrogate me. I didn't even know that you could say I need a lawyer and they would have stopped. So they spoke to me for four, years, for four hours and they wanted me to point fingers at others. They wanted me to wear a wire. None of them I was prepared to do. And they then threatened me. The whole good cop, bad cop stuff, right? And then eventually I called my office and said, get me a lawyer. And the lawyer called me and said, don't answer any questions, right? And you know, the prosecutors have a bag of tricks. I saw every one of them. So at the bail hearing, they said that I have a sister in South Africa. I didn't have a sister in South Africa. I had a sister in South Jersey. And the reason (laughs) they said South Africa is because they wanted to tell the judge I was about to flee. South Africa doesn't have an extradition treaty with the United States. So I looked at my lawyer and said, they're lying. And he said, shh. So the whole system is used to prosecutors lying and with no accountability, right? Now I decided to speak because I have the resume of somebody who fought them all the way, who got convicted because it's not a fair fight. I went to prison. I met so many people who were bullied to plead guilty and who got onerous sentences because of prosecutorial misconduct. And then I said, you know, this, we can't keep quiet about this. This is a big issue. And as I said, not all prosecutors are bad, but the ones that are bad act with total impunity. Now, uh, for the record, 2011, you actually were found guilty on all 14 counts of conspiracy and securities fraud. You were sentenced to 11 years by Judge Richard Hallwell, and uh, you served eight years in prison. You seven were released, and a half. Years. Seven and a half, released in 2019. Correct. When they sentenced you in 14 counts, guilty, 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 what, what was going on in your head? And you have not been exonerated. Have you been exonerated? You have not. No. So uh, what went through my head is we're going to appeal this. And the reason I thought we would win the appeal is that the FBI lied on their wiretaps applications to wiretap me. 
And the statute says that the FBI in any affidavit has to tell the truth. But the judge sided with the, even though he said the FBI affidavit had, was, had a reckless disregard for the truth, he allowed the wiretaps, right? They lied in coaching witnesses who did their crime away from me to say that I was trading on inside information, right? That's another unique part of the American system where they coach and coerce cooperating witnesses. Now, three years later, after my case and I was found guilty, I had a co-defendant, same Southern district, same charges, same cooperating witnesses, and the jury acquitted him. You know why? Because the main government witness had been sentenced to two years parole, and now he was no longer under the leash of the FBI, and he came clean and said, I did not give Raj any inside information. So how do you get your name back? We're talking with Raj, Roger Rotnam, who is the author of Uneven Justice, The Plot to Sink Galleon. How do you get your name back? You have this conviction. You spent this eight years in, of your life in jail, seven and a half. It's a lot of time. Yeah. Well, I'm not trying to read it again, the case. I respect the jury's duty but, uh, verdict, but I don't agree with it. As I said, the juries have made mistakes and 800 people are exonerated, right? But there's a bigger mission here, which is to try to bring some checks and balances to our criminal justice system, whether it's police brutality on the street. We are lucky now that we have iPhones and we can document them, right? But the larger, bigger issue is people who should get 18 month sentences are getting eight years at the whim of the prosecutor. You know, and there's no discussion or little or no discussion about it. Now, I can't get my eight years back, but what I can do is live an extra eight years than what God gave me by working out and exercising and doing that. No, yes, I have no You regrets. look like you lost a lot of weight too, because I saw previous pictures. Was that no, in prison? That I took, I took, you took my your mustache, mustache off? <laughs> yeah, because, you know, the masks got in the way. So it wasn't like uh, I'm trying to change my look. It's the uh, coronavirus uh, took that off. But, you know, um, and you'll appreciate this, Karen. There are bigger issues than Raj Rajaratma. And I don't regret one bit what I did. But now, I'm a human being and I did feel sorry for myself because I didn't do anything wrong. Not a single banker who was responsible for the mortgage crisis went to jail or was charged. That's true. That is true. So when you feel sorry for yourself, how do you survive in prison? What I did was I thought about our young men and women in Iraq and Afghanistan fighting or living in 100 degree temperatures, you know, in arms way with bullets flying. And here I am you know, safe at least, right? And, you know, when I was 11, Karen, I went to boarding school in a different country outside Sri Lanka as 11 year old boy. That was much more difficult. Here I was a grown man. You know, if you're mentally strong, you deal with it. Your hardest day in jail. What was the hardest day for you? That's a great question. I think the, the toughest day was, there was a lot of people who knew of me when, before I came to jail, a lot of inmates. And a couple of them, you know, tried to uh, push you a little bit. At its worst, jails like the jungles of Africa, the strong prey on the weak. And they thought this guy is soft. We can probably get him to send money to a family and so one of the guys from the Bronx uh, came up to me and said, you know, I don't have it like that. I said, I'm sorry. And he said, let me, um, let me uh, keep, it, keep it straight. Either you can send me money or I'm going to take it from you. And I said, you know, champ, I'm not good when you put a gun to my head. 
And then he said, I'll be seeing you. Now, I had never heard the phrase, I'll be seeing you. So I asked somebody, you know, what does I'll be seeing you mean? <laughs> I'm not laughing, but yeah. Yeah, you are laughing. So not, he, I'm said, not, but... he said in the hood, I'll be seeing you means that he's going to fight you. So just be aware because they can come and punch you from behind or they can knife you from behind and so on and so forth. So I said, I don't understand. We are supposed to be men. We are not supposed to snitch to the guards, but somebody can hit you from behind. I said, listen, where I come from, you want to fight somebody, you go man to man and fight. Anyway, he came to my room and started abusing me and yelling. And he was, I was 52, he was 35. You know, he was a true gangster. I had no tattoos. He's whole body was filled with tattoos. And he started saying, I'm from the street. And I said, I grew up on the street too. I didn't grow up in the clouds. Anyway, he came at me and I took my chair and I said, you know, I'm gonna smash you if you take a step towards me. Fortunately, he stopped and everybody came. And the, uh, my reputation was, okay, Raj would fight. But that night when I went to sleep, I was like, damn, you know, this is going to be, a, this is early on. This is going this to be, a, be long, a long prison term, right.